Do you ever wonder what the ultra-wealthy of the future will look like? Well, in the video game Echo, they look like this. No, not her. She's the main character. Look out there. At the planet that's not a planet. What you're looking at is called the palace. It is an entire artificial world created for an ultra-wealthy individual. The palace seems like a strange name to give to something so featureless. You fly down to the surface and discover an endless array of ice-capped monoliths. They hide complexity underneath. After a long descent, you finally navigate to a dark entrance, and the interior of the planet is revealed to you. It turns out that, if anything, the title of Palace was an understatement. It is dizzyingly opulent, every wall covered in intricate detail, laced in precious material, and multiplied in every direction. It's like walking through a gilded kaleidoscope. I typically dislike such busy visuals in game environments, but here I am mesmerized. My eyes are feasting on the excess of shiny and expensive things. Where do I look first? The polished stone floor tiled into an optical illusion? The bronze molding in every corner? The crystal chandeliers? The stoic ivory carvings? I find the craft ship staggering. It seems like every inch has been touched by some sparkling flourish some metallic inlay or marble embossment. I see these details, and I think of the blacksmiths that finessed this metal, the masons that shaped this stone, and the glaziers that cut this glass. It's an overwhelming sight everywhere you look. But I think that the repetition and straight lines help maintain visual clarity. The detail is numerous and intricate, but organized, orderly. The four-way symmetry of the rooms also lends to this sense of order. And you won't find a single spot of dirt or dust or tarnish. The palace seems to be completely sterile, ensuring none of the work is diminished by time. Every surface is meant to dazzle and confuse. And it works. I am dazzled by all the reflections and deceptively complex trinkets and I am confused, in multiple ways. Firstly, by the scale of this place. Look at these towering ceilings and cavernous depths. Why would these rooms need to be this big? And how many people did it take to make all this? How long did it take them? Decades? Centuries? And where are they now? It's as if it was made so large for the express purpose of intimidation. I'm also confused by all the redundancy. Fabulously ornate chairs that would each cost an eye-watering amount, present in more numbers than make sense. Neatly organized to face nothing of clear import. Vases and pillars and tables and stools of impressive make placed as frequently as if they were a dime a dozen. The palace is not just luxurious, it is absurdly luxurious, on purpose. As you descend deeper into the palace, you find new areas, but the same superfluous extravagance. Tables dozens of meters long, full of food that no one will eat. Instruments that no one will play. A labyrinth of rooms and corridors intersecting under and over each other and leading nowhere. It seems to be a place pretending to be for human use, and not doing a very good job at it. 
It's not long before the palace's bright facade of beauty can't help but give way to its sinister face. You are not free to wander. The palace chooses where you can and cannot go. The palace is also making copies of you that attack on sight. Other than them, the whole place is empty. The main character, N, grew up learning about the palace. And as you get to darker areas that she's more familiar with, you find evidence of the horrors that took place here. Metal sarcophaguses for the living. N tells us they're called man cages, and shudders as she recalls their use to discipline those who stepped out of line. Lower still is the mausoleum, where countless nameless are entombed. Is this what happened to all the laborers? And past that, we find the first areas of dilapidation broken columns and bottomless pits where no light dares venture. But, as you go even deeper than this, the palace becomes brighter and more lavish than ever. You've been descending for almost two hours, 339 kilometers. We're getting close. Bronze and silver are replaced by gold and the lighting becomes increasingly divine, the architecture even more otherworldly. This is not a place for people. But then, why was it made? What is its use? The owner of the palace, an individual we know nothing about, isn't even here. The lights aren't even on when you first enter. This marvel of engineering seemingly is just an afterthought for the person who commissioned it. The palace is a jewel among the stars. And like most jewels, its only use is to decorate the wealthy at great cost to the poor. How did humanity come to such an extreme future? It shouldn't be surprising when people today, myself included, are so tolerant of these kinds of places. Not just tolerant, but enamored. Throughout history, the human-made places that impress us the most are often the ones made for the wealthy. Mansions, manors, royal palaces, cathedrals, pyramids. We love these kinds of places and marvel at the exquisite architecture and craftwork. And of course we do. The stone and woodwork is lovingly carved. The tile and glass is colorful and intricate. The shiny metals reflect the lighting in the best ways. Sometimes there are precious gems and pearls. And what about the famous paintings and statues within? or the lush, manicured gardens and fountains in the landscaping. Sometimes it's the sheer size that leaves the greatest impression. So many talented hands came together in so many disciplines for so many hours to build these places. I find them beautiful and inspiring, but most of all I find them infuriating. These places are shrines to concentrated wealth, commissioned by pharaohs and kings and emperors and otherwise horrifyingly wealthy families. All this effort and expense and time put into making something just for them. And the surrounding populations are the ones that shoulder the cost. Taxes or tithes or tribute, whatever name they want to put on it, these luxury properties were paid for by the many, only to be enjoyed by the few, and built by the talented to be inhabited by the talentless. And as if they had any hand in crafting them, the worthless wealthy are so proud of these structures. I think they should be embarrassed. What's worse, just like the palace in Echo, these places are often empty. 
Maybe they're only used as summer homes, or they're just forgotten by the owners who have many such properties. Yet they remain exclusive, becoming nothing more than astonishingly expensive paperweights. Sometimes, like in the case of giant tombs, the uselessness of these places is the purpose. It's not just an issue of wealth concentrating at the top. It is a concentration of beauty. I think a part of why these places are so beloved is because they remind us of the heights of human artistry. They show us what dedication and teamwork and expertise can create. So why should the ultra-wealthy be the ones who get to enjoy the fruits of such labor? I believe common people deserve to have artistry like this in their homes and in their towns. But what do they get instead? Utilitarian architecture, made as cheaply as possible, often to the point of structural failure. The uglification of common spaces is very real. In America, large stretches of gray are a common sight. It's rare that beauty takes any priority in the construction of areas that common people live. In fact, it seems like the greater the population, the less consideration is paid to visual appeal. Not just form, but function is also disregarded, as decaying roads, chipped cement, and cracking brickwork is a common sight in urban places. This uglification is not a neglect, but a purposeful, targeted dehumanization. I know this because the service areas of luxury places are bereft of luxury. The fanciest hotels and vessels and mansions all have areas that are meant for the employees. Service corridors and elevators, custodial closets, break rooms, and so on. And these spaces are in stark contrast to the spaces meant for the high-class clientele. They are poorly lit, unmanicured, bare minimum constructions. And the safety regulations are often ignored in these service areas. So the people who work at the lowest rungs of the establishment must do so in more dangerous conditions. And all you'd have is a candle to light your way. If that. You might not have even had anything to light your way, just the light at the end of the tunnel. This is true of the palace as well. In between the main areas is a network of thin bridges and balconies with no railings, presumably meant for those that maintained and repaired the palace. The aesthetic of these areas could not be more different than those found within the palace. And so it seems, just like in real life, even with all that wealth, the owner decided that the people who actually provide the most value, the laborers, are given the least consideration. More than that, these laborers are also treated as an eyesore, and made to keep out of sight so as not to make the wealthy uncomfortable by their very existence. When the lady of the house came through this beautiful green door with its distinctive clack when it closes, the gardeners would dash off out of sight through the garden wall here to give the family the privacy it craved. There was a lot of work going on behind the scenes. These corridors are hidden between the grand rooms and would have been used to keep the servants and staff out of sight and out of mind. Why should luxury and beauty be democratized? Well, for one, the public already pays for it. Legally, it should be ours. Don't forget, it is the wealth of the people that is concentrated at the top, either by unproportionate taxation or legalized wage theft, or forcibly under threat of violence, and more likely some combination of the three. But the point is that it's ours by right. But even if it wasn't, craftship denotes care, and people who feel cared for go on to care for others. We can see this in the ways that garbage in the streets can create a cycle of littering, and how that cycle can be broken with some attention both to the location of the issue and its underlying causes. We can also see this with how broken school materials and dilapidated classrooms hurt students' ability to learn, and instructors' ability to teach. 
Facilities have an important measurable impact on educational outcomes, according to Roberts, and that they are predictive of the delivery of instruction after controlling for other plausible variables. I think it's important to know um, that the facility condition explains 43% of the variance and the quality of the delivery of instruction after you have held for those other factors. Crumbling infrastructures, according to Aaron McIntyre, uh, in American schools isn't just a political football, it actually presents some physical and psychological dangers. I think this is because if it feels like no one cares about you, it's harder to care about anything yourself. The ongoing decay and ruination of common spaces sends a clear message of carelessness and hostility from the wealthy and powerful. Beautiful architecture and works of art and craftship should be accessible and created for the public. But instead of greenery and color and upkeep for the masses, they spend our money on costly structures that are inhumane by design. This problem isn't just about access and consumption of art, but also its creation. Because getting custom craftwork done on any large scale is prohibitively expensive, only the wealthy can get that kind of work commissioned. Which then means that talented craftspeople can only find a paycheck for their artistic work in the pockets of the wealthy few. If you're a craftsperson watching this, you know that even if your prices are generous, the majority of people just don't have the capital to indulge in the kind of commissions that keep an artist alive. The only way for your business to thrive is to get extremely lucky and find some wealthy clients who can afford your more elaborate work. Without them, the craftsperson will have to eventually move on from the aspirations of their craft, and their talents are lost to the world. Creating art should not bankrupt you. Craftspeople of all kinds deserve a chance to express themselves with quality work and make a living without needing a wealthy benefactor, who will also impose their destructive worldview on the art itself. Subsidy can help achieve this. Subsidy is when a government or an otherwise public body uses tax dollars to assist some industry or business. For example, the US had the Federal Art Project. It began in 1935 as one of the New Deal programs. Its goal was to be a relief measure to employ artists and artisans. The Federal Art Project established more than 100 community art centers throughout the country, commissioned about 400,000 pieces of public art without restriction to content or subject matter, and sustained some 10,000 artists and craft workers during the Great Depression. The program ended in 1943, lasting for only eight years. Today, Poland and Canada both have government subsidies for video game studios. As a result, game studios can hone their craft, improve their methods, hire talented developers, and maybe most importantly, be more resilient if the game sells poorly. With subsidy, one failure does not have to lead to ruin for small-time creators. If the government uplifted craftspeople and democratized art, maybe beautiful architecture could be a common sight, not some exclusive perk of ultra-wealth. Maybe the public would benefit from the ripple effects of having agency and ownership over their spaces. Maybe there could be millions more thriving artists in the world. And maybe creative teams like Ultra Ultra, the developer of Echo, would still be in business. After very little attention and poor sales, the studio shut down in 2019. Echo was this small team's first and last game. Maybe they were trying to tell us something when they made the palace. If humanity has a future, I fear this is it. Dead monuments to greed of terrifying scale. When it should be widespread artistry, subsidized by the public, built by the talented, and accessible to all. <laughs>